Well, the best thing to do is buy a stock that you don't ever want to sell. I mean, that, and that's what we're trying to do. The best thing that you can do is to buy a stock that you never want to sell. And that's what we're trying to do. This is what Warren Buffett has explained for a long time. He doesn't only look for undervalued companies, but he looks for undervalued companies that are world class, that are high quality, that are cash generative, and that he will never want to sell even if those undervalued companies become fairly valued or overvalued. Buffett has purchased companies like Seize Candies, Geico, and Coca-Cola, these high quality companies in a variety of different industries that he himself says he has no intention of ever selling. And that's true when we buy an entire business. I mean, we bought all of Geico, or we bought all of C's Candy, or the Buffalo News. We're not buying those to resell. I mean, what we're trying to do is buy a business that we will be happy with if we own it the rest of our lives, and we expect to with those. He's buying businesses that he can hold for the rest of his life and be happy with those businesses. And not only be happy with them, but the returns that these businesses have provided has had alpha over the general market. This is the investing strategy of Warren Buffett. Simply put, for Warren Buffett, undervalued is not enough. It's not enough. He doesn't just look for undervalued businesses. He looks for world-class undervalued stocks or businesses. He looks for cash-generative undervalued businesses. Ones that are producing profits for their shareholders right now. Not ones that are going to produce profits way down the road or 10 years from now. He looks for companies making profits right now. And he also looks for stocks that you never want to sell, even if they become fairly valued or if they become overvalued. Warren Buffett was able to identify these type of companies like Coca-Cola over 30 years ago. He was able to identify that this company had something special. It had a moat. It had brand recognition, it had logistics and a lead over its competitors, and he knew that it would be a recognized brand that would compound for decades into the future. And the challenge for us is to find the next Coca-Cola. What type of companies have these characteristics where they're going to compound for decades into the future? What type of companies have sustained competitive advantages? Large moats are cash generative, and they will be the Coca-Cola of our generation. Those are the type of companies I've tried to find, and I'm going to outline five of them in this video. The first stock is Google. This is a company that I believe strongly is trading at a heavy discount right now, at least 20%. I think that if you're buying Google right now, you're paying 80 cents for a dollar. That's what I think you're doing. You're paying 80 cents for a dollar. Google's a company that everybody's familiar with. You all know its products. You're using one of them right now with YouTube. And YouTube, by the way, is growing at an incredible rate. YouTube is a media juggernaut that could soon equal Netflix in revenue. This is just one of the products of Google, and now it could surpass Netflix in its overall revenue. Just one of the things that Google has going for it. Keep in mind that Google is a multi-platform company. They operate YouTube, which has advantages over Netflix, because unlike Netflix, where Netflix has to pay for all the production and work with all the actors and the producers to make their content, YouTube is just a platform. And they have content creators like me that create the content for them while they enjoy a split of 45% of the ad revenue. That's how YouTube operates. They have a substantial advantage over companies like Netflix where YouTube does not have to pay for the production of their content on their platform. It's obvious that YouTube is new media and the cable television is old media. Google-owned video platform is seeing a rise in more traditional television advertisers. So advertisers are moving away from cable TV and advertising on YouTube. This means that more money is flowing to YouTube. And the CEO of YouTube said, I think we're scratching the surface with what's possible with commercial intent on YouTube. There's gonna be more creators on YouTube and there's gonna be a lot more ad revenue on YouTube. And keep in mind that this is just one part of Google's business. If we start adding in their other segments of business like Google Cloud, their members network, Google Search, and then Google Advertising, you can see how even though YouTube ad revenue has been growing like crazy, it still makes up a small portion of their business. And every segment of this business is growing substantially. Even with its large size being one of the biggest companies in the world, Google is still a growth company, growing its revenue on average about 20% year over year. In 2020, the revenue was $182 billion. But even more impressive than that is how profitable they are. Being a high margin business, they have a net income of $40 billion. That is an incredible amount of net income. This is one of the most cash generative businesses in the entire world. And in terms of valuation, even the analyst firm Morningstar, which has, I think, conservative estimates on most of their companies, says that Google's trading at a 18% discount. They say the fair value is around $2,900 and it's currently trading around $2,400. So if you buy Google today, you're likely buying it at a discount. 
But like we outlined before, we don't only want companies that are undervalued. We want world-class companies, which Google is certainly one of those. Cash generative, which Google is one of the most cash generative businesses in the world. And it's also a stock that I think even if Google does go up to $3,000 a share and it becomes fairly valued, you probably still want to hang on to it. This is a company that you don't want to sell even if it goes up to fair value or becomes slightly overvalued. So this is a company that I believe meets all of these qualifications and it's likely going to be one of the Coca-Colas over the next 10 to 20 years. Next up, we have Alibaba, the e-commerce giant in China. This is one of the most compelling growth stories in the markets today. It's a company that has multiple business segments like cloud hosting, e-commerce, fintech and payment processing, business to business applications, and so on and so forth. People often compare it to the Amazon of China. That's what Alibaba really is. The company by every metric when comparing it to American firms is undervalued. In fact, it's trading at a steep discount. Morningstar, for instance, says that BABA is trading at a 32% discount, which means that it's trading at around a $100 discount per share. The company's growing incredibly fast. In 2013, Alibaba revenued around $5.6 billion, and then in 2020, it revenued around $109.5 billion. There's very few companies that can compound that aggressively over such a short time period. The growth of this company is staggering. 74% in 2013, 52%, 42%, 27%, 46%, 73% in 2018, so on and so forth. Even at its substantial size, Alibaba continues to grow at rates of around 50% year over year. That's unheard of for a company this large. Now, despite the fact this company has incredible revenue growth of almost 50% year over year, even with its staggering size, and despite the fact that it has an unassailable market position in multiple leading categories like e-commerce and fintech in China, the stock has been on precipitous decline since October, going down over 30% since its all-time highs. So why is this company trading downwards? Why are investors selling out of this company? It could be a rotation out of tech companies, that could explain part of it, but I think there's some extra concerns that investors are worried about with Alibaba. The first is that this is a Chinese company, and investors know that there's political tensions between China and the US. We don't always agree on things. In fact, many things between the US and China, we don't agree on. So investors have to factor in this political tension when making investments in companies in different countries. And with the US and China, there's been threats to delist companies like Alibaba. This is from March 29th of this year from Bloomberg. Why the US is threatening to delist Chinese stars like Alibaba. The reason that the US has threatened to do this, I think are for some valid reasons. The critics say that Chinese companies enjoy trading privileges of the market economy, including access to US stock exchanges while receiving government support and operating in an opaque system. In addition to disclosures of audits, the US initiative would require foreign companies to disclose if they're controlled by a government. So what the US would be trying to do is to say simply, if you want access to our markets and the capital from our investors, then you need to play by the same rules. You need to be less opaque. We need to be able to go in and audit your companies, as well as we wanna know if your companies are controlled by the government. This has been a concern of many US investors and people like Kyle Bass have warned about how China and the US are not playing on equal ground. We've got a trillion dollars of capital moving into China but by, between now and 2021 based upon indexation and passive flows. And we've already got $2.2 trillion worth of listed entities in the US where they don't adhere to US law. This is insane. And I bet, I best, I bet American investors don't know it. Here's another fun fact. When Chinese investors invest in the United States and let's say the Chinese government gives $5 billion to Bridgewater and they make them a billion dollars, Chinese investors investing in the U.S. pay no tax. So all of these things have got to start changing. When we're talking about amending our tax laws, I think we should start thinking about making foreign investors pay the tax in the United States that U.S. investors pay in the U.S. Kyle Bass outlines the same concern that Chinese investors and Chinese stocks are treated differently than U.S. investors and U.S. stocks. They don't pay the same taxes, they're not held to the same standards, and they simply don't play by the same rules. So the threat of Chinese companies like Alibaba being delisted from U.S. markets, I think is a serious threat. I don't see this happening anytime real soon, but I do think it's something that's going to continue to cause this political tension between the two largest economies. 
Another concern about investing in companies like Alibaba is the government interference that comes from the Chinese Communist Party. Jack Ma, for instance, the CEO of China, had insulted the Chinese banking system, calling it old and antiquated, and he talked about how Ant Financial, the company that he owns, is going to rejuvenate it and bring a new tech-focused spin to the financial system. Well, the very sensitive, thin-skinned Communist Party of China and the leaders of the Communist Party that are very fragile and they can't handle criticism well, well, they didn't like this criticism from Jack Ma. And so they retaliated. And so what they did was they canceled Ant's IPO, which was going to be the biggest IPO in the world. China sends a warning to businesses. Beijing shows entrepreneurs the importance of listening to the Communist Party. In my opinion, the real warning that they're sending is that the government there is incredibly insecure and can't handle any level of criticism well. That's the warning that they're sending. In the United States, we have the luxury of being able to insult our presidents directly. We can insult them on Twitter. We can insult them on social media. And we can do so without fearing any type of recourse. That's something special about the United States and free countries is being able to insult our public leaders without fear of recourse. But in China, things are a little bit different. The government has a more heavy hand when it comes to receiving criticism. Now, on top of those concerns of government regulation, we also have a lot of weird things happening with Chinese CEOs. The Pinduoduo founder, for instance, steps down from the company. This is an all-star company in China, and the founder of it is stepping down. The founder of TikTok, Zhang Yiming, is also stepping down as CEO. This is another founder-led giant where he's willingly choosing to step down from the company, a little odd. The Ant Group CEO, Simon Hu, is also resigning. So this is another leader of a revolutionary tech firm in China that is again choosing to step down amid the heightened scrutiny over this company. And then of course we have Jack Ma, the CEO of Alibaba, taking a little bit of a hiatus from public appearances. He just disappeared for a few months. It says here from the Wall Street Journal that he resurfaces after months of lying low, saying the appearance was his first since regulators began clamping down on his business empire. So there's some pressure on Chinese CEOs and founders that doesn't seem to exist with American firms. The turnover seems very high in China. And outlining and guessing all the reasons is difficult, but one thing's for sure, it's different to be a CEO in China than in the US. So where does this leave us with Alibaba stock? I think that overall the pros outweigh the cons. It is true that there's regulatory risk and there's political tension between the US and China, but there's also regulatory risk with US companies as well. Apple's in the courts fighting against Epic right now on what might be changes to how they charge people for their app store. So US companies are not immune to regulatory pressure. And even though Alibaba has faced regulatory pressure and they're working under the Chinese Communist Party, this company is trading at at a substantial discount. And it's rare that you can find companies in the public markets of this magnitude and this growth trading this fundamentally undervalued. So I think overall, Alibaba currently presents one of the best risk rewards in the market. The next company that I believe is undervalued is in my passive income portfolio. It's one of my largest holdings. It's a company that I believe is a world-class asset it's cash generative, and it's one that I believe I'll hold my entire life. This is a company that I've done multiple videos showing in depth how they make money, how they're growing their business, how they are the SaaS king. When you talk about software as a service, no other company does it as well as Microsoft. They are a software subscription company that grows their revenue on pace quarter over quarter. They operate in three different segments, productivity and business processes, the intelligence cloud like Microsoft Azure, and personal computing. And all three of these segments are growing. Microsoft is also a cash cow. They don't only have enormous revenue, but they earned $44 billion in net income last year. So like Google, this is a company that takes in enormous amounts of net income that they can either reinvest back into their business or they can purchase other businesses with. And even with the continual revenue growth of Microsoft, their operating margins continue to increase, going from 34% to 37%. Growing operating margins on a growing business is a sign that this business has a moat, which Microsoft certainly has. In fact, Microsoft has such an enormous moat that credit rating agencies like Moody's consider Microsoft to be more creditable than even the US government, referencing things like their low financial leverage, robust cash flow generation, excellent liquidity, their strong track record of steady financial performance, strong and growing recurring revenue from subscription services, their very diversified customer base and geography, their barriers to entry, so on and so forth. 
everything they list off with this company references how powerful the moat is, how reliable the income is, how low of leverage this company really has, reducing the amount of risk in it, which qualifies them to give it the highest credit rating that only two companies have. Only Johnson & Johnson and Microsoft have this credit rating. And right now, Morningstar, along with most analysts that do fundamental analysis of the stock, have Microsoft trading at a 10% discount. So this is, again, one of the rare opportunities where not only are you buying an undervalued company, but you're buying a world-class, cash-generative, undervalued company that you'll never want to sell. So Microsoft is a company that I'm happy to have in my portfolio. And not only is this company growing their operating margin, their net income, their market cap over time, but they're also a company that pay their shareholders dividends every single quarter. So you do get the added benefit of receiving some passive income from this holding that you can continue to invest in other companies or reinvest back into Microsoft if you want to. The next one that I've outlined, number four is Salesforce, ticker symbol CRM. This company I often refer to as mini Microsoft because they have a lot of similarities. They're a cloud software company that helps run businesses. Salesforce develops cloud computing solutions that focus on customer relationship management. They offer things like the sales cloud to store data, monitor leads in progress, forecast opportunities, gain insights through analytics and relationship software. They also do things like deliver quotas, contracts, invoices, so on and so forth. The simple way to think about Salesforce is they act as an operating system for a business. If you're a business and you need help managing everything from A to Z in your business, Salesforce helps you do that. And the product naturally is very sticky. Once a company signs up with Salesforce, it's very difficult to move away. In fact, it's nearly impossible in some situations without great cost and great time to the developers at that company. So a company that signs up with Salesforce is heavily incentivized to stick with this company. Now, the revenue growth of Salesforce has been phenomenal. In 2013, they revenued $2.3 billion, and then last year, they revenued $21 billion. That's a pretty dramatic increase over a 10-year period. The revenue growth has averaged anywhere between 25 to 30% over the past decade. And they break down the revenue into a few different categories. You have the sales cloud. Salesforce is a player in the cloud business. They're not as big as Microsoft or Amazon or Google, but they are a pretty big cloud company. They do show up on the list of the top 10 cloud companies. They also have the service cloud, marketing and commerce cloud, Salesforce platform, and professional services, which is like consultants. So this is the revenue breakdown of the company. Every category is growing quarter over quarter. Unlike the rest of these companies listed, not only is Salesforce a fast growing company that I think will continue to grow for the long term, but most analysts consider it undervalued on a fundamental basis, saying that it's trading at a 13% discount. Morningstar says it has a wide moat rating, which I agree with. So this is again, one of these opportunities where we can buy a world class business that you'll wanna own your entire life that's currently undervalued. In number five, last but certainly not least, we have Amazon, the online retail juggernaut in the US. They're also the one creating the backbone of the internet, which is AWS and the cloud hosting that that provides to so many companies. Amazon's another company in that big tech area that I believe strongly is undervalued. And this seems counterintuitive to some extent. How can all these really big companies be undervalued? Don't they have a lot of analysts covering them? Don't they have a lot of eyes on them? Shouldn't they be trading at fair valuations? Well, what we've seen throughout history is that companies like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google can trade at low valuations for prolonged periods of time before they have some big breakout. For Amazon, we've seen that pattern over and over again. In 2018, the stock went up like crazy, but then the stock line flattened for a couple of years. It just traded around sideways for a year and a half. And then all of a sudden in 2020, it shot up another 50 plus percent, but then since then it's traded sideways for almost a year. And I've seen the same thing happen in my portfolio. If I go to my Apple holding, I remember buying into this company and at the time, people said that Apple was the most expensive company in the world. It's probably heavily overvalued because it had recently gone up in price but despite those people's concerns about the valuation, Apple continued to appreciate in value. And now going back, that purchase was at a really good discount compared to its current shares. So Apple's an example of one of these companies that even though it's the biggest company in the world and it has the most analysts covering it, it was undervalued when I originally purchased it and now it's gone up to its fair valuation. 
And my prediction is the same thing will happen with Amazon. After this company trades flat for a year, maybe a year and a half, I think it will have another big breakout to the upside, and I think it will go up like it has in the past. Amazon is currently trading at a steep discount, according to most professional analysts. Morningstar, for instance, says that the shares are at a 23% discount, and they say the fair value is $4,200 a share. So not only do we know that Amazon is a world-class wide moat business that's cash generative, one that you'll probably want to own your entire lifetime, and it has multiple growing segments like online sales, physical stores, third-party seller services, subscription services like their Amazon Music, and AWS and a lot of other revenue on top of that, they're a company that's growing in every one of these categories. They're competing in so many different highly profitable areas. Their total revenue in 2020 was $386 billion. That's an incredible amount of revenue. And although their net income is not as high as Google or Microsoft, it's growing like crazy. In 2020, they had a net income of $21 billion. In 2019, they had a net income of $11 billion. So they roughly doubled it from one year to the next. And this is part of their growing revenue and their growing margins. They're continuing to increase their margins and increasing their net income, which is the sign of a company that has a large moat. Amazon continues to grow in numerous ways. One of them is their Amazon Prime membership that has access to music and movies, and they recently purchased MGM for $8.45 billion, which seems like a lot of money, $8.45 billion. That would be a lot of money for most companies. That's not a lot of money for Amazon. $8.45 billion is a very small sum of money for Amazon. So these type of purchases that can be game-changing for streaming services are very small acquisitions for Amazon. That is the scale advantage that they currently enjoy. So that is my list. These are companies that I think are definitely world-class companies. I believe that they are being traded at a discount right now. They're cash generative. All of these are profitable businesses that generate real profits. They're not reliant on debt. They're not reliant on external markets to fund their operations. And they're companies that I think if you buy into them, there's a high likelihood that you'll never want to sell them in the future for as long as you live. You can own companies like Google, Alibaba, Microsoft, Salesforce, and Amazon for 10 years, for 20 years, and 30 years. You could buy them, close your brokerage, and rest assured that these companies are most likely going to do just fine over the coming decades. So that's my list. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you like this type of content, be sure to smash the like button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, and I will see you in the next episode.